Ready? All right, ready to begin. I almost had to delay it because I thought I had a sneeze, but I don't. So let's pray, and we're going to be back at Revelation chapter 6 and talking some more about uh, four horsemen, uh, as is usually called, the uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? So let's pray, and we'll begin. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Christ. Thank you that you are sovereign over every event of our lives and, and this entire creation. We thank you for the encouragement that gives to us. And uh, so we pray that as we study your word this morning, you would bless us and, uh, and teach us. And we pray that you would be with um, everyone that is uh, suffering in some way this morning, maybe because of oppression from a wicked person or from uh, health ailments. But we pray you'd watch over them all and, and encourage them. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, let's read uh, about the seven seals. Remember, the Lamb has gone to the Father, which really is, that was in chapter 5, which really is... Um, a symbolic picture of the ascension of Christ and uh, the uh, establishment of him at the Father's right hand as the messianic king. And all of those things are entailed in that, in that picture in chapter 5. And then he takes the uh, seven-sealed scroll from the Father and begins to open them now in chapter 6. So let's read these verses Again, so they're fresh in our mind. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, Worthy for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, Holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? All right, then, that's as far. We won't even get that far, I don't think, this morning. But um, let's begin by uh, reading. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cite the usual commentaries this morning. And, uh, you know, in this study, I'm learning right along with you. And that's why I, I use... Um, these books, William Hendrickson, More Than Conquerors, You've seen G.K. Beale's shorter commentary on Revelation, and uh, Joel Beakey's commentary on, on Revelation, and then, uh, of course, we've used uh, Simon Kistemacher's commentary on Revelation, and so these are kind of like my teachers here, and I hope they are yours as well, because uh, we, all, we all need some help when, when we come to, to Scripture, but we definitely need it when we come to Revelation. I mean, just how would we sort it all out? Who are these four horsemen and, and so forth? So anyway, let's, uh, if you look at the screen here, I'll pull up G.K. Beale's, uh, sh the shorter commentary. Remember, we say the shorter commentary because his original one was the big commentary, and it's a lot thicker, right? A lot more detailed and so on. So generally speaking, the one you would buy, and you can get it for $20 on Kindle or, or then here in uh, paperback as well. The, you know, this is generally the, the one you would buy if you're going to get one from, from Beale, because it, it's plenty, plenty detailed um, enough. So let's take a look. This is kind of, I'm just going to read you some introductory uh, material here. I don't remember how much of this 
we might have covered last time, but it doesn't hurt to repeat. And, uh, and I, uh, I don't think we did. I don't think we got to these. So, all right. So here's G.K. Beale. This is his commentary on Revelation. And uh, just to give proper credit, it's published by Erdman's. All right. And uh, it's also, it says, with David H. Campbell. So we want, he's a pastor. We want to give him credit as, as well. So here we go. Just kind of an introductory statement here on, on chapter 6 as we come to it. Christ has received all authority from the Father, and taken up his rule over the kingdoms of the earth. All right, we've seen that chapters 1, chapters 2, and chapter 5. The first four seals of the seven-sealed scroll show how this authority extends even over situations of suffering sent from the hand of God to purify the saints and pu pu punish unbelievers. Okay, so there, there's the heart of the thing here. The message we want to get here is that this is telling us, Revelation 6 is telling us, showing us that God's rule, his sovereignty extends even over situations that involve Christians suffering and, and so forth. Um, the, but they come, the, those um, um, oppressive situations, be it persecution, famine, pestilence, whatever, life in this world, wars, and so on. Uh, they're sent from the hand of God to purify the saints. Remember in John 15, the vine? My father's the vine dresser, and what's he do? Well, one of the things he does is those branches that bear fruit, he prunes them. Why? So they bear more fruit. So it's talking about our sanctification. So he sends suffering, there's a suffering from the hand of God to purify the saints and to punish unbelievers. Examples of such suffering have been alluded to in the letters to the churches in chapters 2 and 3. Some Christians may have wondered if Christ really was sovereign over disastrous circumstances, such as Nero, Emperor Nero, right, Roman Empire, Nero's mass persecution on so cruel a scale following the fire of Rome in A.D. 64. Revelation 6, 1 through 8, which includes the horsemen, is intended to show that Christ rules over such a, an apparently chaotic world and that suffering does not occur indiscriminately or by chance. This section reveals, in fact, that destructive events are brought about by Christ for both redemptive and judicial, judgmental purposes. It is Christ sitting on his throne who controls all the trials and persecutions of the church. All right? So there's an overview of the message that we're supposed to get here from, uh, from Revelation, Revelation 6. Um, Hendrickson, in his book, and I've got that here on Kindle to go to the library. Okay, More Than Conquerors, that's Hendrickson's. And... Uh, I got a, here, here we go. Go to that one right there. Um, he gives uh, a, and I should say that one too, since we're putting it up there. Okay, this is Baker Publishing Company, More Than Conquerors by William Hendrickson. And that's what this quotation is from, all right? <clears throat> he says, Thus the entire universe is governed by the throne that is, by God through the Lamb. When the Lamb ascended to heaven, he sat down at the right hand of God, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he, that is God the Father, put all things in subjection under his Christ's feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. And that's a quote from Ephesians chapter 1. All things ultimately must glorify God. His will is carried out in the universe. The throne rules. 
the Lamb reigns. As a result, believers need not fear in times of tribulation, persecution, and anguish. Okay? So, and then he'll start talking about um, the four riders and the horses. The seals described in chapter 6 are symbolic of such times of trouble and persecution. And then Kistemacher, and I don't have him on the screen here. <clears throat> this is in his the New Testament commentary series on Revelation. Um, Kistemacher, he has some really, I'm going to, refer to him several times here uh, this morning, but he has some really good introductory uh, statements here about the, the, the message that we're really supposed to get from chapter 6. He says, the present chapter, chapter 6, describes the history of the world and the church. The account is not a historical sequence of events or a prophecy that, only re that refers only to the return of Christ. It incorporates, all right, chapter 6, is, let's just say for right now, the four horsemen. It incorporates the period between Christ's ascension and, re and his return, during which the gospel, in other words, the church age during which the gospel advances to the ends of the earth. Wars devastate its populations. Famine causes... Famine causes... ...suffering, and death is the constant companion of those who dwell on the earth. Okay, so um, now remember... Um, I forgot the word, right? Uh, it, uh, recapitulation. Remember, the approach here to Revelation, the book of Revelation, is, is that it, it is a recapitulation. You've got the seven seals that come first, right? And then you've got the, the seven. I'll probably get these out of order. I've been focusing on these chapters for so long. But you've got the uh, seven, seven seals, seven trumpets, Seven vials, okay? So, um, <clears throat> and that's not happening sequentially. What's happening is each presentation of the seven is then recapitulated. It's told again, only in different symbolic pictures to emphasize another aspect yet of, of, the, of the present age from the time of the ascension of Christ, his death, his his uh, resurrection and his ascension until the time that he comes. And, uh, and so we want to emphasize also, because he, Kistemacher alluded to that, that for instance, the four horsemen, as they're presented to us here, first the white one, the, the red one, the black one, and the ashen one, or the deathly green one, right? Um, that they're not happening sequentially. It's not something like, well, we're going to look into the future and at some time, uh, just before Christ returns, the, the white horseman will go forth. And then the, uh, you know, that, that, no, that's not futurist interpretation. But no, these are happening all the time simultaneously in world history, in, in this present fallen world. Okay? Now, he goes on here, Kistemacher does. He says, Chapter 6 is divided into three parts. The first four seals form a unit that features the symbolic figures of four colored horses. The second segment portrays the souls. That starts at verse... Um, is it, let's see, where are the souls under the... Is it, that's like the fifth seal, right? Third seal, fourth seal... Fifth seal starts in verse 9. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. Okay, so he says, so the first four seals form a unit, and then the second segment of, of uh, here portrays the souls under the altar and represents people who died for their faith in the Lord. And the last section depicts the judgment and terror of those who reject Christ. Okay, and then he goes on to talk about some more um, 
um, uh, that matter of, you know, is this happening sequentially or simultaneously? And he concludes that, that the warfare, the conquest, the famine, the death are all concurrent. They're happening at the same time all through the church age in any given age or era. He says, in world history, fraught with violence in one form or another, the church occupies a central position. Now, the world disregards Christ's people. It disregards the church as irrelevant, right? Uh, that's nothing. What's it going to say? It's a, uh, kings and presidents and authority and wealth. You know, that, that's the stuff that's really important, the nations and so forth. But in fact, God himself doesn't see it that way, right? The church occupies a central position, and its people repeatedly suffer the brunt of injury and injustice for their witness of the Lamb. The followers of the Lord must, you know, I, I should comment right there. Um, you know, so often in, in the visible churches, which may not be true churches today, but so often um, this is not the picture that's painted, right? It's like, well, there's going to be these four horsemen and this tough stuff that's going to happen maybe seven years before Christ comes way in the future. But right now, right now, you know, things aren't, aren't really that, that bad. But they, are that, but they are that bad, you see. Um, and uh, really oftentimes, I think, Christians, professing Christians anyway, and preachers and so forth, present present the Christian's experience through rose-colored glasses and just willfully blind to these other truths. And that's a serious mistake. The fact of the matter is, as Christ said it, in this world you will have tribulation. This world has hated me. It's going to hate you, all right? And, uh, and so, as he says, uh, the people of God repeatedly suffer the brunt of injury and injustice for their witness to the Lamb. In fact, beware if you're popular with the world, right? It's like I like to say, you know, think about it. Has your profession of Christ ever cost you anything? Ever. Think about it. Because if it hasn't, well, something's amiss. It's not that you have to go out and be an obnoxious person, you know, like uh, some of these guys you'll see standing on a street corner preaching and screaming, getting in people's faces and so forth. I'm a Christian and I hate that stuff. But no, all you have to do is profess Christ and live for him. And people will see that in you and, 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 and the wicked in the world, the world will, will hate you for it. So has your profession of faith in Christ ever cost you anything? The followers of the Lord must tread the same path Christ has trod, the path of faithful witness to the truth, even to the point of death. So the opening of the seals implies that the saints on earth suffer from anti-Christian forces until the day of Christ's return. And I think we're going to find out, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, that, that in fact, we're in the Great Tribulation. This, this whole era between Christ's ascension and his return is the, great, is the Great Tribulation. It's no wonder, then, that the martyrs in heaven are crying out to God for justice. They're told to exercise patience and know that God sovereignly controls world history. His wrath and that of the Lamb are directed against those who have expressed their enmity to God, His Word, and His people. These enemies must face the judge. Okay, um, The Lamb opens the seals one after another so that the events described pictorially in the scroll might be fulfilled. By breaking the seals and opening the scroll, the Lamb inaugurates... God's plan and reveals what must take place in the times before and at his coming. And by breaking the seals one by one, the lamb is repeatedly shown to be the initiator of the events. Okay, so, so um, that's why John, back in chapter 5, was weeping, you know, when they couldn't find anybody to open the scroll. It's because um, 
This was God's plan of uh, ultimate redemption of his people, judgment of the wicked, the, the, the whole thing. And unless there is someone who is um, rightfully uh, qualified to open those seals and effect that uh, judgment and the deliverance of Christ's people, that's not going to happen. But then we find out, well, the Lamb is, is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb, right? That's because he, he, can, he can open the, the scroll. Okay, um, that one was to page 220. All right, so we'll come back to that book, uh, uh, book in a moment, too. Uh, in fact, right quick here. All right, so now here's the question, then, obviously, that you come to in chapter 6. Who are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Who are the four horsemen that go out when the, when the first four seals are, are broken? Well, let's take a look here at the first one. And uh, back up here. So you've got white, red, black, and then I guess there's some uncertainty about that color ashen or it's kind of a pale green or anyway, whatever the color of death is, that's what that fourth horse is. So, but it opens up with, the lamb opening one of the seven seals, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to, uh, and to conquer. Now, here again, Kistemacher, these are all really good commentaries, but this is, this is a really good one on this section. He gives a great overview on the different views, and I think there's like four of them, uh, different views on who is this rider with a crown on a white horse, and he's got a bow, and he, so he gets this crown, obviously, from the father, and he goes out conquering, all right? Um, so, so who is he? Well, Kistemacher says that um, there are four main proposals, and have been, down through church history, as to who the rider, this rider on the white horse is. And those four positions are, one, the Antichrist, two, the Parthians, and they were enemies of Rome. We'll read more about them in a moment. So Antichrist, the Parthians, Christ himself, and finally, the gospel, that is, the word, the word of God. So, so here's the view that the first rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. And we'll learn more about him later on as we go through Revelation, the man of sin, right? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, but Kistenbacher says, actually, the view that the rider on the white horse is the Antichrist is, is in fact the predominant view, that it's the predominant view among, well, down through church history. Um, and what he's saying is that, you know, the, the red horse, the black horse, and the ashen horse are all negative, destructive, judgmental uh, figures going out into the, into the world. And so it seems like the first one would be, um, would be too. So he says the horse was used in warfare. The bow signifies a weapon to kill people. The crown denotes victory and, and so forth. And the color white points to an ancient custom of having the victor of, in, a, in a battle ride on a white horse when he returns. And so it's seen as a parody. You know, in Revelation 19, you have clearly... Christ, the Word of God, returning, riding on a, on, on a white horse. And so the people that hold to the view this is the Antichrist here um, say that this is a satanic parody, a satanic counterfeit then of Christ. You know, Antichrist, anti can mean against, but it can also mean instead of, the instead of Christ, the, the, counter, the counterfeit. Christ and so on. Um, but as he notes, there are some 
difficulties that, uh, that uh, cause him to conclude that, no, this is not the, the Antichrist. He says, predominantly in the Bible, the New Testament, white, uh, and even in Revelation, denotes holiness, purity, victory, and justice. It's not used to describe Satan and, uh, and so on. So that's one reason. He also says that the phrase conquering and to conquer in Revelation never is applied directly to, uh, to Satan, all right? So anyway, I won't go into detail as to why he rejects that idea, but that, that's just kind of a, uh, an overview of why he, he says, no, I, I don't think that that is a, is a uh, the Antichrist, and neither does William Hendrickson, and uh, neither does G.K. B- or uh, Joel Beakey, and we'll we'll get into what G.K. Beale says about these horsemen uh, in in a little bit. So, all right. So the second proposal is actually I hadn't heard of this one, but I guess it's been around for some time. Is that the the rider is uh, represent the white on the white horse represents the Parthians, and Kistemacher says the the Romans could never fully subdue the Parthians. The Parthians lived in an area that's now known as Iraq and Iran, and in A.D. 62 they defeated the the Romans, and uh, they had a victorious general. They went out on white horses, of course like all the armies, I guess, then they use bows and arrows as their primary weapons. Um, one of their leaders was called the Conqueror. And, I, and apparently, I guess I haven't heard this figure of speech, but I guess it's still used today, a Parthian shot. Oh, that was a Parthian shot, which means uh, very, very accurate markmanship, okay? Now, he, um, he um, Kistemacher doesn't, by that either, and he gives some reasons why he doesn't. Um, Closer to what Kistemacher concludes is William Hendrickson, more than conquerors, his view, uh, William Hendrickson concludes that the white, the rider on the white horse is Christ, okay? And Hendrickson gives a really thorough argument, as he he always does, for, uh, he gives seven reasons for interpreting the saying that, that Christ is the one on the, on the white horse. And um, for instance, as I mentioned, in Revelation 19, we'll see again that Christ returns riding on a, on a white horse. And so um, I won't go through the seven reasons here if you do get Hendrickson's book. Actually, I got Hendrickson's book on Kindle, this one, More Than Conquerors, for free because like I'm a, I'm a prime member or whatever it is anyway. It didn't, it didn't cost um, anything at all to get it on Kindle, but he, he gives seven reasons. Now that's actually not too far from what Kistemacher here is going to conclude, but as Kistemacher points out, the uh, conclusion that the rider on the white horse is Christ has one big problem. And, uh, and I, I was thinking about that myself, and then I, I was reading um, Kistemacher here, and I, I came across it. He says, there is one problem <clears throat> that surfaces with the concluding that this is Christ. Namely, Christ is the one who breaks the first seal. And then he himself, according to this view, that it's Christ, comes forth in obedience to the voice of one of the living creatures. So in other words, the view that this is Christ uh, has to deal with the awkwardness of the fact that it's the Lamb who breaks the seal and sends the rider. So the Lamb would be sending himself, and, and that does seem kind of strange. So what, what Kistemacher proposes is that um, Christ, the Lamb, who is called the Word of God, is sending forth the gospel, okay? And that's what Kistemacher concludes, that the rider on the white horse 
is not a negative thing, but he goes out conquering and to conquer. And a crown, authority is given to him. He's personified. It is the word of God. It is, it is, it is the gospel. And, uh, and so li listen to Kistemacher on this. This is really good. Um, Christ is sending forth his gospel that in the history of the church has always proved to be unstoppable. The word of God cannot be bound, 2 Timothy 2. God's sending forth his word to achieve his purpose. Remember, Isaiah 55, it won't return to him void. And so the word is set on conquering the world. Um, I admit the picture of the first seal doesn't say anything about Christ's gospel, but, but Christ says in uh, his discourse in Matthew 24 that's kind of parallel to this, that he, he speaks definitively about the gospel of the kingdom. Well, let's, let's take a look at that. That's in the Olivet Discourse. It's in Matthew 24. So here we go, Matthew 24, I'll start up in verse 6. So just think about the, uh, the uh, well, actually, I'll start in verse 3. Think about the parallels here between what Christ is saying here in Matthew 24 and what we're seeing there with the, the rider the, uh, in, on the white horse in Revelation 6. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. Emphasis on many, okay? And uh, you, you could have include all fake preachers there too. They lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. Okay, so now like right now, is Russia going to invade Ukraine? And could that, you know, those local events like that, that's what starts world wars. You got two nations one of them, they want to duke it out with each other. Everybody chooses up sides. The next thing you know, the, the whole world's at war. And so, but you know, those situations have been with us, just like Jesus said, all the time. That's the characteristic of, of this age, all right? So, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And then here you have verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And that's one of the verses then that um, Kistemacher points to as in support of his conclusion that the preaching of the gospel is that the, that the white horse, the rider on the white horse, is the, is the preaching of, of the gospel. So, um, and Kissmacher by no means is the only one that, um, that concludes that, all right? Now, um, this means then, let me move that book over there and uh, um, go back to Revelation 6. Okay. So I'll just give you this overview. One of these books here, I might have the note on it here, so we might come to it again, but it's like, here's the picture. You got the, the rider on the white horse, which is the gospel being preached throughout the world. Now, what always follows whenever the gospel is being preached 
in this world. Well, what follows always is the red horse, which we're going to see is especially persecution of believers. And you've got the black horse, which is famine and poverty, which again, in relation to Christians, is common because if you, if you profess Christ, it's going to cost you. And it can cost you economically. And, and back in those days, you know, the trade guilds throw you out. You can't, even, you can't even do business and so on. And then the fourth seal, death and Hades following along, sword and famine and so forth. So it really makes a lot of sense that here is the gospel going forth. And then as it's preached and we're in this warfare in this world, these are the things that we can that we can um, that we can e- expect. Um, in connection with this, then, since we conclude, and I agree anyway with with uh, Kistemacher, I think that's a, a really solid uh, conclusion. And really, we're not far off from William Hendrickson either, as he says this is Christ. But um, but think about this then. Here's the gospel. And it's going forth, this white horse, this rider with a crown, authority, um, goes out conquering and to conquer. He conquers by preaching the word of God, the, the, uh, the preaching the gospel. The gates of hell won't prevail against it. Christ is going to build his church. But what is the effect then, uh, the inevitable effect of, of the preaching of the gospel in this wicked, sinful world, besides the fact that God's elect, as they hear it, are are saved and recognize the Good Shepherd's voice. Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 10, and I want us to think about this pretty carefully here, okay? Matthew 10, down in verse 34, then, here we go. Now look, and think carefully about this. This is Jesus talking. And so here he has sent by his sovereign authority, he has sent the gospel out into the world. Book of Acts, right? And, and today then um, as well. What are we to expect? Well, he says, do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And by the way, we've already seen Jesus with that sword. Remember, go back to uh, Revelation 1, the initial vision here, right? Um, Here we go. The midst of the lamp stands one like a son of man clothed with a long robe, and he goes on to describe him. Here we go. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. So out of his mouth comes, it's, it's, the, it's the word of God, okay? Um, and then, and that's not the only time, right? Yeah. See, later on in chapter 19, from his mouth, this is the return of Christ. Um, see, He's clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the name by which he's called is the Word of God. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. How does he do that? It's his word. It's it's the gospel. He goes out conquering and to conquer, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. All right? So so then, uh, let's see, wait a minute. I'm going to go up here. Matthew 10, right? That's where we were, verse 34. So here we are. Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. What's the sword? It's the gospel. It's the word of God. It's the, um, isn't that also in, uh, let's see, let's check it out here. Uh, Ephesians. Six. Whole armor of God. Take up the whole armor of God. Um, 
feet shod with the gospel of peace. And here it is. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That imagery is consistent throughout, throughout Scripture here. So the Christian sword is the gospel. And, and that's how it's depicted here in, uh, in, let's go back again to Matthew 10, and then also in these chapters in, in Revelation. So, um, do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, let me just, um, you know, this is one of these spots where you get accused of being, eh, it's too narrow, you know, and so forth. But here it is. I didn't write this. I didn't write this. This is Jesus' own words. He said, don't make the mistake of thinking, all right? You, you claim to be a Christian. So don't make the, the mistake of thinking that in this world, you are going to have peace. We have peace with God. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. We have peace with God in Christ because we're justified. But we are not at peace with the world, and the world's not at peace with us. Furthermore, it is the gospel that um, is guaranteed to not bring peace. It, it, it is a sword, and it conquers, and it divides. So what's going to happen when, so, when people hear Christ's voice, his people hear his voice, and they hear the gospel, and they're saved? What's going to happen? Well, everything around them that is still in the world and of the world is going to be against them. And this division comes at the most intimate levels. I've said lots of times that the family, the family is like the biggest obstacle and stumbling block because it becomes a person's idol. Jesus is saying here, look, people in your own household, your father, your, your mother, your, your in-laws, your children, okay, they're going to be your enemies, if they don't also follow Christ, they will be your, your enemies. If you're a Christian, and, and you know any of you listening, and many of you have experienced this, you're going to be the odd man out. You're going to be the, the black sheep of, of the family, right? And uh, it didn't used to be that way, but when you came to faith in Christ, that's, that's, how, that's how it was. Now, let me suggest something else to you. And that is that this truth is being denied in, in most of evangelicalism and most of what claims to be Christianity today. And if you think about it, you know that that's true. It's being, it's being denied. What is being taught is that Christ does bring peace now. And that if you're a Christian, you should be able to be at peace with everybody, even if, they're, even if they're unsaved. Furthermore, if you're not, it's your fault. You've done, you've done something, that, something that is wrong, you see. So really, think this through. Do most people that profess to be Christians when they go to church on Sunday, right? Do they go there with the mindset that following Christ is going to cost them 
these kinds of, of relationships and so on? Do they, do, they, uh, do they go there and expect that the gospel, the word of God, is going to bring division? You know what? Some of your churches need to divide. They need to. They need to be, they went out from us because they're not of that. that because, and, and, and you, don't, you don't have to make that happen. All you have to do is be a Christian and follow Christ. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and, and, and follow him. And, uh, and pretty soon, you know, then the, these divisions then happen. So, and Jesus just says it very plainly. Look, anybody, if you idolize your family, how many people today have made an idol out of their family? Might be parents making an idol out of their children or children making an idol out of their, their immediate family or even their extended family, all right? And uh, the pressure's put on them. You know, um, you're expected to be one of the family. Come on, family, there's nothing more important than the family. How many people? That's, that's idolatry. There's, for the Christian, <laughs> there's plenty that's more important than, than the family, right? Um, think of all the emphasis that we've seen in the last decades in evangelicalism on the family. Focus on the family. We're going to focus on the family, the family, the family. And it's turned into an idol, so much so that anybody who would dare uh, cause division, bring a sword and cause division and disrupt the peace, right, of the family, well, you're necessarily sinning. Well, need to read this scripture again, right? Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So we all need to think very, very carefully about this. It is not fun to be hated by your family members, right? It's not fun. But I'll tell you what, if we follow Christ, that's what's going to happen. Furthermore, if we stay back and make the family an idol because we don't want to make, you know, just got to keep peace with everybody, not only are we not following Christ and Christ won't have us, but we're functioning as a stumbling block to that family. You know, our, our unsaved family doesn't need to have somebody else that's more, you know, compromising and so, well, I just want to get along with everybody and so forth. What they need is they need to be confronted with Christ. They need to hear this, the sword, the gospel of Christ and be shocked by it and then see you following Christ and, and encouraging them to, uh, to come along then as as well well there so there we have we're out of time but there we have that first rider the first the white horse and its rider has a crown given to him by god and a, a sword and he goes out conquering and to conquer and we conclude that then that is the gospel the the word of god and then that most certainly the red horse the black horse and the ashen horse, right? persecution, famine and poverty and suffering of believers and, and uh, even death and martyrdom are going to follow in this fallen world wherever the gospel goes. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this encouragement. We pray that, that these words would be an encouragement to your people, that uh, as we hear all around us from people that claim to be Christians, that maybe we're too narrow, we're troublemakers or whatever, but that we see right here in your word that, um, that people that really need to be worried are those that, uh, well, beware when all men speak well of you. And so, Father, we, we pray that you would continue to encourage us and that we would not be downcast, but we recognize then that that you are sovereign, you've sent the gospel, 
out into the world, and you are sovereignly in control of the next three horsemen as well. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.